Good morning. Uh, I'm Lee Smith. This is Roy Williams. And uh, we're going to talk today about uh, taming the uh, Cessna 180, 185. Roy came to me uh, about two months ago and said, hey, I want to improve my wheel landings. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I uh, teach in the 180, 185 and the 190, 195. And uh, today we're going to go over the 185 or 180 here that he has and uh, talk about the nuances and uh, improve his uh, landing skills and on the uh, 180 doing wheel landings. Um, an interesting part is Roy and I met uh, 35 years ago. I signed Roy off for his private uh, glider license and he got it uh, 35 years ago. So here we are 35 years later uh, working on some uh, wheel landings. Still, Roy? Lear still learning. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Anyhow, what we want to discuss and what we're going to do here today is why the uh, 180, 185 is, is so uh, different than a lot of the other tail draggers. So Roy, the first thing I want to talk about is the tail of the 180, 185. And we'll just say 180 today, meaning both airplanes, but the tail is very heavy on those aircraft. It takes about three people to pick that tail up in, into the air. And if you go around to the Satabria that's over here, or some other, uh, there's a cub over here, one person can pick that tail up. And so you've got this big rudder with this light tail, and that makes the aircraft a lot easier to handle. The 180, on the other hand, we have a, a pretty good sized rudder, but the tail is so heavy. And once that tail starts to get out of alignment, it's very hard to bring it back into alignment. So we have to really focus on keeping the aircraft straight. Flaps, if it's a 20 knot crosswind, I'm using no flaps for takeoff and landing. The reason being is if the airplane starts to come around a little bit on you with full flaps, now that upwind flap is working just like a vertical stabilizer. The air is grabbing it and it's helping to push you around more. So we want to use less flaps, the stronger the crosswind. Do you have a, a range of speeds as far as when you would use partial flaps? So you say 20 knots, you wouldn't use any flaps at all? Correct. You would so, use 20 degrees of flaps up to what kind of wind so speed? So the book crosswind limit is 12 knots on the airplane. So anything above that, you're going to have your hands full. So anything over 12 knots, I'm going to be 20 degrees flaps on an aircraft that does not have a Robinson stall kit. If it has a Robinson stall kit, any crosswind is a no flap takeoff and landing in my book. With a stock without Robinson stall, you can use 20 degrees of flaps or zero. The reason on the Robinson stall is if flaps come down, the ailerons come down, you lose aileron effectiveness. The next issue, of course, is the spring gear. And uh, the Fabry has a spring gear but it's a much lighter spring gear, so it's not quite so springy. On the 180, 185, the spring gear is, is very stiff, and if you happen to drop it in, it's going to uh, rebound you back in the air. And if you continue to fight with it, um, it's not gonna end well. So in most cases, you get one free skip, and after that, you need to do a go around. So it's very important to, to touch down at the proper attitude. The other issue, um, Roy, if you jump in the airplane, I want to talk about the aileron travel. So we're talking today with this 180 about the ailerons. The majority of uh, all ground loops is usually a cause from not following through with the ailerons. A lot of people think it has to do with the rudder, and the rudder is important to keep the fuselage going straight down the runway. But I guarantee in all ground loops, it's the lack of using proper aileron that has caused the ground loop. One of the problems with the 180 is that when we move the ailerons to the yoke to the 50 degree mark, go ahead and do that, Roy. You can see, um, yep, keep going a little bit more right there. That's where most aircraft uh, yokes stop when you're at the aileron stop. Now, Roy, if you'd go the rest of the way, the yoke almost turns upside down, and you see we've now doubled the amount of, of movement of that aileron. This is where people get in trouble with ground looping the aircraft, 
they think they've got enough aileron in from flying previous airplanes and on a 180 the yoke it goes to about 130 degrees so it's very uncomfortable you need to get the yoke all the way back and all the way to the stop and it's very uncomfortable to the left to the right it's not so bad but everybody has a problem with getting to the stop very important to getting to the stop on rollout we want to keep the wings level or slightly tipped into the wind but what's really important is the downwind aileron when we <clears throat> get that in this case a left crosswind that downwind aileron is what actually creates the drag and helps to pull the nose back to the center line so when we're rolling out in a crosswind continue to follow through with the aileron slowly to the stops it's extremely important and also get the yoke all the way back the airplane settles right down and is, will track nice and straight as far as taxiing we've all learned how to taxi around in a proper placement of the yoke or the stick for where the winds are blowing on this aircraft again the tail is so heavy you'd need a 60 mile an hour wind to pick the tail up on this thing so yes you want to use proper technique but it's not as important as it is in a, in a Super Cub or a light-tailed aircraft. The airplane's going to go on its nose. Why do you think it won't? We've got plenty of height already in the landing gear, so as far I, I would think that most people have the same concerns that I do of having a prop strike, things like that, prop clearance. So, you know, as, as long as we don't have any momentum going over center, then we should be good as far well, as there, not going over. Correct. The reason it won't go up on its nose, you can push the yoke full forward rolling down the runway. And it's not going to go up on its nose because a stabilizer won't allow it to. The elevator's sitting there trying it full, full down trying to pick the tail up, but the stabilizer will only go so far before the air load will push it back down. So you can take and go full to the stops and the airplane will go a little bit past level, but that's where it's going to stay because there's too much air load pushing the stabilizer down. And I'm sure probably the sight picture is daunting for a lot of pilots also when they see that nose pitch forward. Uh, but people get timid on the yoke. Correct, end. but it only pitches forward a very little bit. It won't go uh, like you think. And so the problem with wheel landings in this aircraft is that people are concerned about hitting the prop and so they're very timid to push forward on the yoke. Now, when we do a good wheel landing, what we're wanting to do is come down about three foot we round out but the nose is only going to come up about an inch okay from our pitch attitude on final very slight would we'll be holding back pressure as the mains touch when you feel the drag of the mains that's when we ease forward the nose really isn't going to go down but the yoke's going to go forward about an inch to two inches forward on grass it might go to two and a half inches forward because grass is going to want to put us back in the air with because it's not perfectly smooth. So the problem we have with wheel landings is people being timid about putting the forward pressure once we touch. Again, I want to state, as we're touching, we're holding back pressure on the yoke. Then we ease forward once we feel the drag of the wheels. There are some folks out there, they get close to the ground and they'll just push the yoke forward stop us for a second so we are talking about doing the wheel landings as we come down final we have a set pitch attitude your nose will be roughly eight inches below the horizon we're going to hold that attitude the bottom of the wing is going to be flat we're going to hold that attitude till we get down about three feet off the ground the nose will slightly come up no more than an inch slight round out and as the, as the mains touch down we'll be holding back pressure on the yoke you'll feel the drag of the tire spin up and at that point we release that back pressure all you're doing is releasing it and you might ease forward a little bit the nose should not really dip down much it should pretty much stay where it's at but the yoke will actually move an inch and a half inch to inch and a half if we're on grass it might move as much as two and a half inches to keep the aircraft pinned we let the aircraft then roll for about three seconds now what are we doing with power at that time at, when you're transitioning? What, what do you do with the power? So you're going to have a little bit of power on as you're coming into land. I do uh, my wheel landings with power on, but once the tires touch, power comes off. Power B is, is yes, your sure. enemy. Once you touch down and you're rolling out, power is now your enemy. So you want to make sure you're at idle. 
we roll for about three seconds and we relax, we bend holding forward pressure, we relax that forward pressure and when the tail wants to come down we then fly the tail down. Once the tail touches, this is where it's very important, the yoke comes all the way back. And I mean all the way back. Everybody goes, oh, I had it back. No, you don't. All the way back, like you're pulling it out of the instrument panel. That is very important to getting this airplane, especially in crosswinds, to do what you want. So we want that yoke all the way back. If we have a crosswind, we'll be slowly easing those ailerons into the stop. So you have it all the way back, all the way to the stops on rollout. In a crosswind, very important that once you land and you get into this position, get the airplane stopped. So many people go, I'm going to roll up to the next taxiway and turn off, and the next thing they're ground looping the aircraft and going, what just happened? Well, I can tell you what just happened. They're so happy to be on the ground, they've taken all the control inputs out. They've released the back pressure, they've released the aileron, and the next thing, they get a gust, and they've now ground looped the airplane going, what just happened? So whenever you're in a crosswind, land, stop on the runway, get your flaps up if you did have some flaps out, and then taxi off the, uh, the runway. One thing on strong crosswinds, we do not want to use full flaps. You want to use 20 or no flaps. If it's a 20 knot crosswind, I'm using no flaps for takeoff and landing. The reason being is if the airplane starts to come around a little bit on you with full flaps, now that upwind flap is working just like a vertical stabilizer. The air is grabbing it and it's helping to push you around more. So we want to use less flaps the stronger the crosswind. Do you have a, a range of speeds as far as when you would use partial flaps? So you say 20 knots, you wouldn't use any flaps at all. Correct. You so, use 20 degrees of flaps up to what kind of wind so speed? So the book crosswind limit is 12 knots on the airplane. So anything above that, you're going to have your hands full. So anything over 12 knots, I'm going to be 20 degrees flaps um, on an aircraft that does not have a Robinson stole kit. If it has a Robinson stole kit, any crosswind is a no flap takeoff and landing in my book. With a stock without Robinson stole, you can use 20 degrees of flaps or zero. The reason on the Robinson stole is if flaps come down, the ailerons come down, you lose aileron effectiveness. Perfect.